few philosophical schools or movements have been as influential on the Western religions as that of Neoplatonism. Originating in late antiquity with figures like uh, Plotinus, Porphyry, Iamblichus, and Proclus, it would come to play a decisive role in the theology and philosophy of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. In this episode, we're going to trace some of that influence, and in particular, look at the different ways in which Neoplatonism has manifested itself and been adapted to various degrees in the intellectual and mystical thought of Islam. A complex topic to be sure, but one that is very significant for a better understanding of the history of philosophy, religion, and mysticism in general. Once again, I am so honored and happy to say that this is part of a major, massive collaboration with my friends and colleagues here on YouTube. Uh, I'm doing this uh, collaboration on Neoplatonism together with Zevi from Seekers of Unity, Justin from Esoterica, uh, Angela Puka from Angela Symposium, Dana Trell from The Modern Hermeticist, and John Verveke. We're all making separate episodes covering the relationship of Neoplatonism to different intellectual, religious, and spiritual and even scientific uh, traditions and schools of thought throughout history and today. So be sure to check out all the other videos by the other people. I will leave links to those videos in the description. You'll find videos about the relationship of Neoplatonism to Kabbalah, Gnosticism, magic and theurgy, uh, the Platonist philosopher's creed, and even cognitive science. It's really amazing stuff. So be sure to follow those links and check out all those other channels. Neoplatonism is truly a massively important topic, overlooked as it has often been in earlier philosophical scholarship. It is a philosophical tradition that is deep and complex enough in itself, and we have dedicated a separate episode to exploring and trying to understand the general ideas of Neoplatonism, which you should definitely consult before watching this episode. It will provide some essential background knowledge that is needed to appreciate our discussion here today fully. But as a very short summary, Neoplatonism, sometimes called Late Platonism, is a late antique development within the school of Platonism, primarily associated with figures like Plotinus. It conceives of existence as consisting of different levels or realities, hypostases in Greek, beginning with the highest uh, reality called the One or Tohen. Uh, a concept that cannot be understood or described in any way, being hidden in a radical apophatic darkness. This one then emanates or flows over into something called the nous, often translated with words like intellect or mind, which is the archetype of all things in the world and the place of the platonic forms. Nous then also emanates into the so-called soul or psyche, which in turn creates the world of nature or our physical universe of time and space. The Neoplatonists then conceive of a return back from the physical, up the ladder of reality, back to the nous and eventually to the one. So everything flows from the one and returns to the one, and the goal of the human being is to turn away from physicality and the material, traveling inward and contemplating his true noetic reality, thus returning to her home in the noose, and there experiencing a mystical unity with that noose, and even maybe ultimately with the one itself. There is a lot more to these ideas, of course, and I highly, again, suggest you go watch my previous episode, which covers uh, the thought of Neoplatonism more generally. Uh, but for sure, these ideas in their different forms and different interpretations have been massively influential on the Abrahamic religions, influencing their theology and uh, the category that we often call mysticism in general. And Islam is no different. When we look at the intellectual history of Islam, from the Falsafa tradition of Ibn Sina and others, to the Kalam theologians and Sufi mystics, aspects of Neoplatonism can be found everywhere. This is truly a fascinating topic, but also a complicated and very 
vast one. There is so much to explore when it comes to Neoplatonism in Islamic thought that there is no way of doing it justice in a single episode unless we want to be here all week. So our goal today is to give a more general overview of this landscape, touching on some examples and trying to understand the way that these Muslim thinkers conceived of the relationship between these two traditions. So where does this story begin? Well, basically at the very beginning. In the earliest years of the Islamic religion and its civilization, Muslims had access to these ideas. During the height of the Abbasid Caliphate in the 9th to 10th century, and during the so-called translation movement, texts from all around the world were translated into Arabic and studied by the Muslim and non-Muslim philosophers and theologians. Many of these translated texts were obviously Greek, and the ancient Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle had a high standing and reputation in this context. There was a general attitude that any knowledge or wisdom was good as long as it didn't contradict Islamic teachings, and a common opinion was that these old philosophers basically believed and taught the same thing as Islam, albeit imperfectly. So when we read the early Islamic philosophers like Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, and Ibn Sina, we see them argue that these same truths can be found in philosophy, as in the Qur'an, only expressed in different languages, both in symbolic terms and, and literally. A few of these translated texts became especially influential on the trajectory of the Islamic intellectual tradition. In particular, there was a text called the Theology of Aristotle, the Uthuligia Aristotelis, which became perhaps the most widespread and popular source for philosophical teachings. As the name suggests, the text was thought to have been written by Aristotle, who for much of the medieval period was seen as the philosopher par excellence. Indeed, he was often simply called the philosopher. But Plato and others were also seen as important, of course, and in fact, the Muslim thinkers did not believe that there was any major discrepancy or difference between the teachings of Plato and Aristotle, but that they represented a single tradition of philosophical truth. So when these texts, like the Theology of Aristotle, appear to have ideas that we would recognize as significantly more Platonist in nature, that wasn't strange at all for them. But in fact, as it would become clear much later, the theology of Aristotle was not a work by Aristotle at all. Instead, it is an Arabic translation, or in kind of a paraphrasing semi-copy, of the Enneads by Plotinus, the figure who is often seen as the founder of Neoplatonism. In particular, it was a translation or paraphrase of Enneads 4 through 6. So while the Muslim thinkers thought that they were reading the ideas of Aristotle, and they would indeed adopt actual Aristotelian teachings in terms of logic and natural science through other actually authentic works, they were actually reading and adapting ideas from Neoplatonism. And this becomes a decisive thing for the whole history of Islamic thought, which became infused with Neoplatonic influence. Just to drive this point home even more, another key text in this early context was another semi-translation called Kalam fi Mahd al-Khayr, Discourse on the Pure Good, known later in Latin translation as the Liber de Causis. This text was also attributed to Aristotle for much of the Middle Ages, but as it turns out, it was actually a modified translation of the Elements of Theology by Proclus, another central Neoplatonic thinker. So as you can see, the Islamic scholars were introduced to key Neoplatonic ideas and texts even if they didn't realize it themselves. But after all, this is all just semantics in the end, because regardless if this was Neoplatonic or Aristotelian ideas, the Islamic scholars saw in these ideas a kindred tradition to that of Islam. That the same truths were expressed in these texts as in the Quran, only in a different way. And as we'll see soon, you can kind of see why. So now we have a general understanding that Muslim scholars of various kinds were introduced to Neoplatonic ideas through these different translated texts, and that there was often, although not always of course, a general open attitude towards these ideas that were often seen as being in harmony with Islam and that they could actually complement that religion. So how does this show itself, or how does this manifest itself across history in Islamic thought of various kinds? Well, like I said, the Islamic thinkers saw in the Qur'an many indications that it was expressing the same truth as that of philosophy. 
in verses like, quote, Surely we belong to God, and to him we return, and, quote, As he originated you, so you will return. The meaning of these verses, of everything originating from God and eventually returning back to God, sounds very Neoplatonic, don't they? Everything originates from the One and returns to the One. This is one of the core characteristics of the philosophy. Furthermore, the concept of the One and the strictly transcendent monotheistic God of Islam seems to basically be pointing to the same thing. Indeed, one of the names of God in Islam is literally Al-Wahid, the One. In any case, the Islamic thinkers saw these similarities and ran with them. This was clearly the same truth, expressed in two different ways. And we find this in different schools and movements in Islamic history. The least surprising place to find Neoplatonic influence is perhaps in the Falsafa tradition, that group of philosophers that very openly were reading and building on ideas of their Greek predecessors. In other words, thinkers like Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, and Ibn Sina adopted the ideas and language of Neoplatonism to a major degree in their philosophical exposition of the Islamic religion and beyond. While Plotinus himself oscillated between using the word God to refer to the nous sometimes and the one other times, the Islamic thinkers would basically exclusively identify God, Allah, with the concept of the one, the utterly transcendent simplicity beyond description and understanding which originates all other realities. This originating, or creation, especially in thinkers like Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, often take the form of emanation as a key feature. The One, or God, emanates or flows over into that which is other than him, in other words, creation. God is perfect, and that perfection necessitates that he creates the universe through an overflow and emanation from his eternal light. They also then theorize that the first thing that God creates is the first intellect, followed by a bunch of other intellects often identified with the planetary spheres of Ptolemaic astronomy. So as you can tell, here we have some of the most basic characteristics of Neoplatonism used to complement and explain Islam's conception of God creating the world. To dive a little deeper into this, let's look at one particular figure, probably the most famous, influential, and significant philosopher in Islamic history, Ibn Sina also known under his Latin name Avicenna. In most of his philosophical work, including the massive Ashifa, the healing, the fascinating Al-Isharat wal Tanbihat, remarks and admonitions, and even short treatises like the Risalat fil Ishq, the treatise on love, he shows his clear debt to Neoplatonic language and metaphysics. Famously, Ibn Sina defined God as the necessary being or necessary existent, Al-Wajib Al-Wujud, the only existent in reality that is necessary, the only being that has to be by its very nature and whose essence is existence itself. He has a whole famous argument for the existence of God in which he comes to this conclusion, which we should probably discuss properly in a separate episode. In any case, God is necessary in himself and the causal factor behind all other existence, who are contingent rather than necessary. They exist, but they might as well not exist. So they, they don't have to exist, but they always have a cause, so to say. In any case, we find similarities in Ibn Sina's God, or necessary being, both with the Neoplatonic One, but also with Aristotle's prime mover. He, along with his colleagues, didn't just copy the ideas of the Greeks, as many have wrongly claimed. As I hope you will see, the Islamic thinkers built and developed those ideas further in fascinating ways, partly as a result of the fact that they based their interpretations on the Quran and Islamic, you know, the basic teachings of Islam. So many people often claim that, well, the, the Muslim thinkers, they simply copied the Greeks. This is not true. The Muslim thinkers were very original. They took, of course, huge inspiration from many of the Greek philosophers, but they built upon those and innovated on those ideas to a major degree, which, again, I hope you'll see in some of these um, thinkers that we'll be talking about today. For example, Ibn Sina's necessary being is in many ways similar to the Platinian one, but in other ways it differs. While Plotinus would say that the One is beyond things like being or existence and knowledge, Ibn Sina's God is that reality which has those attributes per definition. He writes in a work called the Danish Nama, quote, It has become evident, therefore, that there is a primary entity in the world which is not in the world, though the being of the world comes from it. Its existence, which is necessary, is due to itself. 
In reality, it is absolute existence. All things exist due to it in the same manner as the light of the sun is due to itself, whereas the illumination all other things receive from the sun is accidental. This analogy would have been correct if the sun were the basis of its own illumination. This is not the case because the illumination of the sun has a subject, whereas the being of the necessary existent has not subject but stands by itself. God has existence. He isn't beyond existence, but absolute existence itself, from which all other existence derives. Now you could argue that this is just a semantic difference and that Plotinus meant a similar thing when he said that the one is beyond existence, but the difference is definitely there on the page at least. And as we go down the chain of being, we see that he, like we said before, adopts the idea of emanation from the first principle or necessary existent through the mediation of intellect to the material world, as well as the possibility of an ascent or return back up that ladder. According to Ibn Sina, from one there can only appear one, and so the first thing that originates or emanates from God is the numerically singular first intellect, which is called in Arabic the aql, the intellect, or literally the aql al-awl, the first intellect. Now this is of course very similar to the position of the nous, translated as intellect, in Plotinus as well. Unlike God himself, this one intellect has a kind of multiplicity in it though, as it contemplates both itself and its source, God. So this leads to the fact that it creates another, second intellect, as well as the body and the form of a celestial sphere. In Ibn Sina's system, there follows nine intellects in the descending order from the first intellect, all associated with a particular planetary sphere and sometimes also identified with the angels of religious language. At the bottom, we reach the tenth intellect, also called the active intellect, which rules over and emanates the sublunary material world that we live in. Now keep in mind that to Ibn Sina, all of this is controlled by God. It is not that these intellects have creative powers in themselves, per se. The active intellect doesn't create the material world. God creates the material world, but he creates the material world through the active intellect. So we have a pretty platonic or Plotinian system here, one that however expands the simple idea of the one intellect concept in Plotinus to instead include ten separate intellects. We also mentioned that Ibn Sina includes the idea of the ascent or return, which is so important in Neoplatonism. Indeed, even though Ibn Sina is seen as a peripatetic, rational philosopher who figures in a strictly logical philosophical tradition, he also has a pretty strong mystical side to him. Was Ibn Sina a mystic? There's debate over this, but we can certainly confirm that his writings include some definitely mystical ideas. The last part of his masterpiece called Isharat wal Tanbihat was dedicated to mysticism or Sufism, and works like the Persian Danish Nama, the Treatise of Love, and the commentary on Hay ibn Yaqsan, not to be confused with the novel of the same name by Ibn Tufail, describe a kind of mystical ascent back from the material to the higher realities. In some places, he even speaks of the possibility of the self uniting with the necessary being. In any case, Ibn Sina or Avicenna is obviously one of the most, if not the most, significant philosopher in the history of the Islamic world, and his influence was immense, both in scholastic Christendom in Europe, but also in his native region and religion. Even the Kalam theologians were influenced by him and his ideas. Although they often criticized and rejected many of these particular ideas, some aspects have still made their way into mainstream Kalam theology as well, both in Sunni and Shia Islam. And in Shi'i Islam, we in fact have one of the most clearest manifestations of Neoplatonist philosophy in all of the Islamic world. Indeed, the Ismailis, who are the second largest branch of Shi'i Islam, basically adopted Neoplatonism as the core of their entire theology from the earliest periods until this very day. While they of course added their own flavor to it, the Ismailis are possibly the Muslim group that adopted the system of Plotinus to the fullest extent and connected it in unique ways to Islamic concepts of prophecy and revelation, eschatology, creation, etc. Their idea of God is also identified with the One, and in a similarly apophatic way. God is beyond all being and descriptive concept whatsoever. 
This is followed by the intellect or the aql, which is the source of revelation and the Qur'an. Uh, the intellect is the umm al-kitab or mother of the book mentioned in the Qur'an, and it is the light which the Prophet Muhammad received and translated into human language as the Qur'an. This is similarly followed by the universal soul, the nafs al-kuliya in Arabic, and then the world of nature. When we read the great Ismaili theologians and scholars, there is no denying the fundamentally Neoplatonist basis of their entire system. Thinkers like Abu Yaqub al-Sijistani followed Plotinus relatively closely, while Hamid al-Din al-Kirmani expanded the vision of reality into further complexity. Ismailism has already gotten a dedicated episode, which you can go back and watch if you want to know more, uh, particularly about their fascinating Neoplatonic uh, theology and the ways that they implement that into their uh, perspectives and, and ideas on the Islamic religion. But it is a very significant and important piece of the puzzle here. It's really interesting to see how core Islamic and Quranic concepts are equated, often very elegantly, with Neoplatonic themes. For example, in the Jami al-Hikmatayn of the Ismaili philosopher and poet Nasir Khusro, he describes eschatological themes of the resurrection, gathering, paradise and hell in allegorical platonic ways. Quote, If it is asked what is paradise, we reply that it is a world of spirits and a mine of delights. And if it is asked what is hell, we say that it is a mine of agonies and torments. If it is asked what the gathering is on the Day of Judgment, we reply that it is the assembly of particular souls in the presence of a universal soul. A key part in the chain of Neoplatonic influence on Islamic thought is the anonymous and mysterious group known as the Ikhwan as Safa, or the Brethren of Purity, who is known to us through their 50 epistles, the Rasa'il Lichwan as Safa. In it, they tackle themes of philosophy and Islam through esoteric ways and with strong Neoplatonic leanings. While they were anonymous, most scholars today are fairly certain in identifying the brethren as a group of Ismailis in particular, which makes sense based on what we have just said. But their epistles nonetheless would be very influential on later developments, both in Shi'i and Sunni Islam. We already talked about the mystical tendencies of Ibn Sina, and mysticism is indeed perhaps the most fruitful part of this whole discussion. Now, as we know, the word mysticism is incredibly flawed in many ways, but I think we all kind of know what we mean when we use that term. And in Sufism, which is often called Islamic mysticism, we find a lot of parallels with Neoplatonism. And this is for good reason. As we saw in the dedicated episode on Neoplatonism, Plotinus is often considered a kind of mystic himself. An important part of his philosophy was the idea of the ascent of the soul, the idea that because everything comes or emanates from the one, it all also returns back to it. The self, or some aspect of the self, is always in the noetic world. It is in the noose, or the intellect. And there is a possibility, and even encouragement, to turn away from this lower material world and return inward, to journey inside oneself and soul, to go to its deepest depths where it is one with the noose, and thus experience what is called a mystical union with the noose. Platanus even seems to think that it is possible to shed all forms of individuality and separateness, and thus be mystically united with the one itself. If you know your mysticism, these are obviously some of the most recurring and important themes in that whole tradition or that, you know, the whole category of mysticism. And Plotinus and Neoplatonism is a key point and a key influence on that whole vocabulary and the whole symbolism and all these descriptions and, and ways of describing the mystical experience. And obviously in Sufism or Islamic mysticism in general, we find it as well and all over the place. From the earliest Sufis like Dhul-Nun al-Misri, Junaid, Darani, and the school in Baghdad, we see an emphasis on the mystical journey or path. 
that the devoted Muslim mystic should purify himself through renunciant practices, asceticism, prayers, and devotion, so that his soul can become refined, eventually shed its attachment to the material world entirely, and even reach the state of fana, or annihilation in God, when the mystic loses all sense of separate existence, becomes extinguished, and only God himself is witnessed as the truly real, like the only reality. It is this experience, similar in many ways to the union with the one described by Plotinus, that is expressed in ecstatic utterances like Halaj's famous Ana al-Haq, I am the truth. And at the same time, in this early period, we see similar but unique mystical developments in the Islamic West, in Al-Andalus. Here, the charismatic mystic-slash-philosopher Ibn Masarra develops a form of philosophical Islamic mysticism, strongly Neoplatonist in nature, where there is a focus on the concept of ettebar, contemplation, and ibra, literally crossing over from the sensible world to the world beyond. A process of ascent, which starts by contemplating nature itself and its beauty, which are the signs of God, then ascending to the higher realms through gradual levels of contemplation until one reaches the top of the ladder. The followers of Ibn Masara, which came to be known as the Al-Mu'attabirun, the contemplators, became quite influential in Al-Andalus and the Maghrib, and would become a major influence on the philosophical Sufism of figures like Ibn Arabi and Ibn Sabain. Because these Neoplatonic adjacent ideas are indeed present throughout Sufism, broadly defined. Not just the spiritual ascent that we have mentioned, but also the idea that the created world is a kind of image or mirror of the divine archetype, something similar to the Platonic world of forms. And this is not just in the sometimes more controversial thinkers like Ibn Arabi, who we'll dedicate a lot of time to later, but some of these themes can also be found in some of the most mainstream and widely accepted Islamic authorities in history, such as Abu Hamid al-Ghazali and Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. For example, in his Mishkat al-Anwar, the niche of lights, which is essentially a commentary on the light verse in the Qur'an, Ghazali seems to present ideas that are rather Neoplatonist in nature, such as for example a process of emanation in reality. Using this symbolism of light from the Qur'an, Ghazali writes in the Mishkat that there is a hierarchy of light, from the lowest to the highest, that the human, you know, Sufi as he was, the human being can climb up this sort of hierarchy on the journey back to God, and God is seen as the first light. He also writes that these lights flow out from each other, and in the end he states that there is actually just one light, which is God. And this is all very Neoplatonic. Furthermore, in the same book, in the Mushkat al-Anwar, he also seems very strongly to indicate that everything in this physical world is a kind of copy or mirror of the spiritual world, which reminds us a lot, of course, of the world of forms and the Nous doctrine in Neoplatonism. He writes, quote, even though there are two worlds, spiritual and physical, sensible and intelligible, etc., the divine mercy provides a correspondence between the two realms, in such a way that there is not a single entity in this world which is not a symbol of the other world. But one of the most interesting and significant figures in this context is of course the Sheikh al-Akbar, the greatest master Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, perhaps the greatest expounder of Sufi-oriented metaphysics in history. His school of thought, which is often known under the name Akbari or Akbariya, contains some really strong Neoplatonic themes, whether or not that was intentional on his part or not. Indeed, he has even sometimes been called Ibn Aflatun, the son of Plato, because of these sometimes really strong Platonic features of his system. Now it's important to once again stress the fact that these thinkers themselves simply saw themselves as explicating Islam and nothing else. If the pre-Islamic Hellenic philosophers said things that correspond to their own ideas, that is simply because of the fact that truth is truth, and truth is not exclusive to Islam, even if it is the truth to the fullest extent. Earlier philosophers and mystics also had access to truth, sometimes even earlier divine revelations, which explains why the ideas of someone like Plotinus are so similar to their understanding of the Qur'an and of Islam in general. According to them, this was a long mystical tradition that stretched back to figures like Aristotle, Plato, and 
all the way back to the first man, Adam, but which was perfected in the Islamic tradition. And even though Ibn Arabi wasn't really a big fan of falsafa or philosophy as such, he does recognize that there is truth there. He even refers to Plato himself as Aflatun Ilahi, the divine Plato in the Futuhat al makiyah Furthermore, in the preface to that massive magnum opus, the Futuhat al makiyah the Meccan Revelations, Ibn Arabi makes clear that truth is always truth, regardless of who says it. We shouldn't disregard everything a person says just because he is an unbeliever or that he has faulty opinions in some respects, because some of what that person says can still be true, and truth is always good. Quote, As for your statement, the philosopher has no religion, the fact that he has no religion does not prove that everything he says is false. This ability to assess truth and falsehood is a perception by means of reason, using the primary rational faculty which every intelligent person has. Later he says, quote, So when there comes some matter that the intellect deems possible and the lawgiver is silent about, it is inappropriate for us to reject it outright. We may choose whether or not to accept it. Furthermore, we must not forget the mystical and experiential side of things. Not only did these thinkers see a correspondence between Quranic slash Islamic teachings and, for example, Neoplatonism, but their mystical experiences confirmed as much too. When someone like Ibn Arabi writes, he does so based on mystical unveiling and illumination, experiences of the truth itself, experiences of the real or of reality as it is. These experiences not only confirm the truth of the Islamic religion to them, but also corresponded to ideas in Neoplatonism. When Plotinus describes not only union with the One, but also the general structure of reality as emanating from the One and consisting of a kind of unified whole in some way, as well as the mirroring of the spiritual and mundane world, this seemed to be the same thing as what they themselves experienced while in a heightened mystical state. So if we want to believe their claims of mystical experience, this is an important piece of authenticating evidence. And even still, when we read Ibn Arabi and find what are arguably Neoplatonic themes, he usually doesn't use the philosophical terms. He does talk about the intellect, aql, every now and then, but more usually he will use Quranic terms, such as the pen, the qalam, and only sometimes sort of allude to the philosophical concept, saying, oh by the way, this is synonymous with the intellect, or whatever. This will be clear soon, but it confirms what we have been saying. Ibn Arabi and his followers, as well as those like them, saw themselves as simply explicating and exploring the depths and the truths of the Islamic religion, of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. And if there is a correspondence there with ideas in other schools like Neoplatonism, that is a mere result of the universality of truth, and not that they have been quote-unquote influenced by that school and then apply it to their religion. Whether we want to share their view of this situation or believe them, so to say, is of course up to us, but it is an important perspective to keep in mind. So the teachings of Ibn Arabi are incredibly complex and deep, and there is no way we can do it justice here. But according to this mystic, all of the cosmos is seen as the self-disclosure or manifestation of God. To be more specific, it is the manifestation of the attributes of God. He likes to employ a famous hadith Qudsi where God says, quote, I was a hidden treasure and I loved to be known, so I created the world so that I might be known. The hidden treasure referred to here is God's own reality, his qualities and attributes which he loves or wishes to see manifested to be experienced in a mode other than his eternal self-knowledge of himself. To Ibn Arabi, God in his absolute form, God in himself, so to say, is referred to as the essence, a thought in Arabic. The essence cannot be described or understood in any way. It is utterly impossible to experience God's essence. It is utterly transcendent of all qualifications or delimitation. We can only say that it is, if even that, but not much else. This essence of God, and the name Al-Haqq, or the real slash the truth, is often used by Ibn Arabi to refer to it, is beyond all concepts, even concepts like unity or oneness itself. But at the same time, it somehow contains unlimited possibility, or should I say, actuality. Pretty similar to the Platonian One, isn't it? But God also has a relationship with that which is other than him, that is, the world of creation. 
And when we talk about God in relation to creation, we refer to him with various attributes and qualities, which are also expressed through his names. God, in fact, has an infinite number of attributes. His reality is completely unlimited, after all. So this aspect of God as a reality in relation to the world is sometimes referred to as the level, al-martabah, or the divinity, uluhiya. But these attributes, names, and qualities are only actualized as relationships to the world, because as we saw, the actual essence of God is completely beyond any such descriptions. The essence contains these unlimited attributes somehow, even though we can't attribute anything to it. They are, as we saw, the hidden treasure talked about in the Hadith, but they don't exist there as separate realities or parts of the essence as such. They cannot be conceptualized as different from the utterly simple essence. But as we also saw in the Hadith, God wants, or even loves, to see his treasure manifested, actualized as something to be experienced. So he creates the world for this reason, to be a place of manifestation for the attributes in his essence. But in order for this unfathomable essence to become something more concrete, it needs to delimit itself somehow. And indeed, because God is utterly non-deliminable, not even non-delimitation can limit him. In other words, because there is no limit to what God can do, he is also able to limit himself in some way, because if he couldn't limit himself, then that would of course be a limitation on him. So while the essence itself always remains utterly perfect and unchanged, the divine reality somehow delimits itself in stages, in the process of creating the world. He becomes conditioned or entified in a process of entification, ta'ayun. The first step in this process is often referred to as the most holy effusion, fayd al-aqdas, or the first entification, at-ta'ayun al-awwal, which results in something often called the al-ahadiyya, the unicity. This is still God, but God as he sort of looks at himself. Here, the attributes of God become a thing that can be recognized, but still as part of an essential unity. This most holy effusion or emanation, notice the Neoplatonic language here, is still taking place in God in a way, so to say, and beyond time and space. It is God as he knows his own infinite attributes and qualities, as well as coming to know the infinite ways that these attributes can become manifested in particular forms. We often see Ibn Arabi refer to this reality as the reality of realities, the haqiqat al-haqaiq, or the universal reality. Sometimes also the Muhammadan reality, haqiqat muhammadiyya. It is the realm in which all things take place, a kind of place that is neither God nor the cosmos, but also kind of both God and the cosmos at the same time. It is the archetype of all reality, the place where God has knowledge of all things, all of his own attributes, and all of the ways that those attributes can be manifested as actual particular things. But it's also a kind of term for the totality of everything that is other than God, God that is God as the essence, but in an unmanifested way, although from a certain perspective there is nothing other than God. In other words, it's kind of a logos principle. About this topic, the scholar William Chittick writes, quote, Drawing from terminology he uses elsewhere, his followers call this reality in God the most holy effusion, al-fayd al-aqtas, and they define it as God's self-disclosure to himself in himself, or the self-knowledge by which he knows every concomitant of his own infinity. They contrast it with the holy effusion, al-fayd al-muqaddas, the creative act that brings all realities and entities into manifestation. This reality of reality slash Muhammadan reality, the unmanifest aspect of all these entities in God's knowledge, appears rather similar to the nous or intellect of Neoplatonism. It has a lot of the same characteristics and seems to have a similar role to play. But this statement also becomes difficult and problematic, as we will see soon. I've personally always had trouble grasping this particular aspect of Ibn Arabi's thought. It's really difficult and confusing, and to be honest, to actually understand all of this on a rational level probably isn't even possible according to Ibn Arabi himself. What we need to know is that God knows himself, his attributes, and their possibilities of manifestation, and the world is created to actualize that purpose. So through his merciful breath, the breath of the all-merciful, he creates the cosmos. This is the holy effusion, Fayd al-Muqaddas, 
His being or wujud is given a place of manifestation. God creates the world through his merciful breath, and thus the ayana thabita, the immutable entities, those um, ways, those infinite ways that God's infinite attributes can become manifested as particular things, come into being, right? They are given existence, or they are lent existence from God, and thus they exist. But in Ibn Arabi's thought, it is also a very central theme that just as everything uh, is created from God and everything comes into being, it also constantly returns back to God. So here is that classic Neoplatonic doctrine of the inflow and outflow, or rather the outflow and the inflow, right? That everything comes from the one and returns to the one. In Ibn Arabi's thought, this is represented by the breath of the all-merciful. God breathes the world into existence. And at every single instant, at every moment, the world is created anew. So uh, existence, as we look around in the world, it is a constant uh, flow of things coming into being and then disappearing and coming back into being at every instant, which is represented by this breathing, this breathing out and breathing in of God's breath, which creates and returns, um, in which the world is created and returns to back at every moment. It's really beautiful symbolism. And what is the first thing that God creates? The first step in the origination or emanation of the cosmos? The first intellect. Aqal al-awal. So here we see the triumphant appearance of the intellect or nous again in classic Neoplatonic fashion. But Ibn Arabi also seems to have extended part of the classic nous doctrine to his idea of the reality of realities. In any case, the first intellect has the role that it usually has in these kinds of schemes. Ibn Arabi himself describes it as, quote, the bearer of everything that is known high and low, which takes from God without intermediary. It is the place where all the knowledge of things that will be is collected and stored. It is still beyond time and space, and so it contains all of God's knowledge and the different ways that God manifests himself in a unified way, so to say. Quote, The first student that accepted knowledge through learning, not essence, was the first intellect. It came to understand from God what he taught it. He commanded it to write what he taught it in the preserved tablet, the universal soul, that he created from it. So he named it a pen. God replied to it, Write what has been, or what I have taught, and what will be, or what I will dictate to you, which is my knowledge concerning my creation, until the day of resurrection, nothing else. The intellect has a central role to play in reality. It is sometimes equated with the concept of the Holy Spirit and with the Nur Muhammadiyah, the light of Muhammad, which is the inspiration for all prophecy. Indeed, aside from being the place where all of reality is contained, so to say, it also has a strong connection with revelation. In the thought of Ibn Arabi, there are three modes of revelation where the entirety of God's attributes are mirrored. One is the Qur'an of nature, that the cosmos as a whole is a sacred scripture and the place of God's self-disclosure. The second is the human being, the microcosm to the universal macrocosm that also reflects all of God's qualities. And then thirdly, there is of course the actual Qur'an in terms of the scripture recited by the Prophet Muhammad. Indeed, in the Compendium of Sufi Terminology by Abdul Razak al-Kashani, a famous 14th century thinker from Ibn Arabi school, the first intellect or pen is synonymous with the Quranic concept of Umm al-Kitab, the mother of the book, a kind of archetype for all sacred scripture, including the Arabic Quran. Whatever the case, this first intellect then emanates the second creation, the universal soul, Nafs al kuliya this soul has one face turned towards the intellect and God, and one towards creation. Quote, So the first mentor in the cosmos is the first intellect. The first learner who takes from a created mentor is the preserved tablet, that is the universal soul. This nomenclature is shariat, that is according to Islamic law. For the rational thinkers, the name of the preserved tablet is the universal soul. It is the first raised up existent thing that is acted upon by the intellect. In relation to the intellect, it is like Eve in relation to Adam. It was created from it and it was coupled with it. Thus it became two, just as wujud, or existence, became two through the newly arrived thing, and knowledge became two through the newly arrived pen. <laughs> 
The soul then emanates the world of nature and the sensible universe as we know it come to be after this point and sort of below soul, so to say. Now, as we said earlier in this discussion, while there is no doubt that Ibn Arabi employs these very Neoplatonic themes, he doesn't necessarily like to use the philosophical terms as such, at least not as much. And he doesn't even consider himself to be doing philosophy or to take these ideas from Neoplatonism at all. Indeed, in terms of the intellect being the first aspect of creation, he doesn't have to look further than the hadiths themselves. In fact, there is another famous hadith that Ibn Arabi likes to refer to, where Muhammad is thought to have said, quote, The first thing that God created was the intellect. Or in another version, he says, quote, The first thing that God created was the pen, which to Ibn Arabi is, of course, synonymous with the intellect. And indeed, rather than using the philosophical terms, Ibn Arabi prefers to use these Quranic ones, as we have seen in the quotes. The intellect is called the pen, al-qallam, and the soul is called the tablet, al The pen contains the knowledge of all things and writes upon the tablet, which thus receives that knowledge and actualizes it in some way. Aside from Quranic terms, he will sometimes also use metaphorical language. For example, the intellect is often represented by the eagle, and the soul by the dove, or the ring dove. Nowhere is this as explicit as in a relatively early and short treatise called al ittihad al kawni fi Hadrat al-Ashhad al-Ayni bi Mahdur al-Shajra al-Insaniya wal-Tuyur al-Arba'a al-Ruhaniya Cosmic unification in the presence of the eye-witnessing through the assembly of the human tree and the four spiritual birds. We refer to it simply as the Ittihad al-Kawni, or the, the treatise on unification from here on out. In this work, Ibn Arabi describes a mystical experience where he has plunged into the depths of his own reality, which turns out, of course, to be God's reality, and there experiences a vision of a universal tree and four birds that are sitting in this tree. Each of these characters, the tree and the birds, present itself to the mystic and even has their own poem to go along with it. To summarize very briefly, it turns out that the tree represents the universal or perfect man, the insan al-kamil, the accomplished person who perfectly reflects the reality of realities, that is, the totality of all God's names and attributes in a single form. We might assume that it is in some way himself that Ibn Arabi experiences here. In any case, this tree also has four birds, all of whom represent important aspects of that reality, the reality of the perfect man, which is synonymous with, in a way, with reality itself, because he is a reflection of the, the structure of reality and of the divine, the divine world. The ring dove represents the tablet, the universal soul. The royal eagle represents the pen, or the first intellect. The Anka, or phoenix, represents prime matter, another philosophical concept that should not be confused with matter as we know it, but a kind of higher matter from which even imaginal and spiritual forms are made. And lastly, the fourth bird is the black crow, which represents something called the universal body, which we could consider the, 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 the physical world as a whole in a sense. This is the crow that represents the sort of lowest aspect of reality, which in this text turns out to not be very low at all. If not, it actually sort of praises the physical world in a sort of anti, not, not outrightly anti-Gnostic, but a kind of uh, the opposite of the Gnostic argument of saying that the people who, who, who discard the physical and the material world as evil or, or dirty or ugly are completely mistaken. There is a nobility and beauty to the to the created world and the physical world as well, as it is a reflection of, of God and of God's attributes. So in this particular treatise, we have a pretty straightforward exposition of key Neoplatonic ideas, but expressed through Quranic and Islamic language. But like I said, we find these ideas all over his writings and the writings of his followers of the Akbari school to this very day. From the concept of the essence of God being very similar to the Platinian One, to the ideas of emanation or effusion, to the nous or intellect concept, which, while confusing, can be found in both the teachings of the reality of realities as well as the divine pen, and even, of course, the next stage of the emanation, which is the universal soul or tablet. This is all very neatly within a very characteristically Neoplatonic kind of scheme. Being a mystic, Ibn Arabi also, of course, emphasized the return back, a renouncing of worldliness and turning inward to our true reality. 
ultimately we can become annihilated to reach the state of fana and become united with God, becoming one with the one, alone with the alone. Just like Plotinus, Ibn Arabi teaches us that God is always present to us and that it isn't a question of returning to God or even actually uniting with him, but in a way just realizing that God was our very being and reality to begin with. The world, including ourselves, are simply the ever-changing and fluctuating self-manifestation of God's being and attributes, the eternal unfolding of possibilities inherent in infinite actuality itself. Whether this is the result of direct or indirect influence, or rather a question of uh, two expressions of the same truth based on mystical experience and unveiling, is hard to say, but it's without doubt true that ideas of, of a Neoplatonic character can be found in the, the key teachings of the school of Ibn Arabi and really all of Sufism and to some degree all of Islamic thought in general or I should say most of Islamic thought. Of course, it should be remembered that Ibn Arabi and his school, while of course very influential and important, do not represent all of Sufism or even the majority of Sufism, but he has been and, and still is an important piece of that puzzle. And we can see from this and from our general discussion that Neoplatonic ideas can be found in various places all over Islamic thought from uh, philosophy to Kalam theology to Sufi metaphysics. Even today, there are many in the Muslim community who try to maintain and revive the school and philosophy of Neoplatonism as a, a very strong uh, component of the Islamic religion and its, and its theology, basically. Um, people who belong to the Akbari school, the school of Ibn Arabi, of course, who still have many followers around the world, to uh, modern uh, scholars like Khalil Andani, who I've worked with on this channel in the past, who uh, has written many articles arguing for the value of Neoplatonism in Islamic theology as a very important uh, tool for, for, for doing Islamic theology, but also for the world at large as a kind of very uh, usable philosophical system. So as you can see, some of those core ideas associated with Neoplatonism can be found all over the intellectual tradition of Islam in different ways. From the apophatic nature of the one, the idea that the core of reality, the source of all things, is this apophatic nature that cannot be described or understood in any way that is completely transcendent of everything in terms of the, the world of multiplicity or anything we can imagine or conceive of. That is one of the core features of a lot of Islamic uh, thinking about God. Even in the Quran, we see uh, similar tendencies of this incredibly transcendent monotheistic God, but also in a lot of the Islamic thinkers from Ibn Sina to uh, the Sufis, of course. A lot of the theological schools have these ideas, even though they do affirm that God has certain attributes as mentioned in the Quran, that has always been a kind of debate within Islamic theology. How do we reconcile this idea of the divine attributes with the other idea of God's complete transcendence and uh, dissimilarity from all things? Some Islamic scholars chose to follow the Neoplatonic system more closely and have a more extremely apophatic conception of God such as the Is Ismailis, for example, who adapted the Neoplatonic model to, to a much larger degree than perhaps most Mus Muslim scholars, but also people like Ibn Arabi, who conceives of the absolute nature of God as this concept of the essence of that, which is completely beyond any description or understanding. Secondly, another key Neoplatonic idea is this idea of emanation, that the one or reality, the different hypostases or levels of reality emanate from one another. The one emanates the intellect, which emanates the soul, which emanates the world. And in a lot of Islamic thinking and philosophy, we also see the very same idea from people like Ibn Sina, same with people like Al-Farabi, who also conceives of this emanation of various different intellects, 
to many of the Sufis who would also conceal reality in many similar ways. Suravardi and his illuminationism has these different lights that emanate from the, the Nur al-Anwar, the, the light of lights. Uh, even Al-Ghazali talks about lights that emanate from or flow out from each other. And of course, as we saw, Ibn Arabi uh, has an incredibly Neoplatonic system where even God becomes entified or becomes somehow uh, somehow emanates into these different uh, levels in which the being of God can, can sort of manifest himself. It's all over the place in that sense. And lastly, in Neoplatonism, there's this idea of climbing back up this ladder of reality from the mundane world to leave the physical behind and travel inward to find our true spiritual home or our true reality and somehow even become united with the divine, this idea of Unio Mystica, which is so uh, common to Neoplatonic thinking in general. This we also find, of course, all over the Islamic intellectual tradition. Even in the rational philosophers like Ibn Sina, he also conceives of the sort of highest achievement as this union with the necessary being, becoming united somehow with God. However that is interpreted, that language and that symbolism is, is key to many of these philosophers. Even Ibn Rushd, or Averroes, who is very anti-Neoplatonic in that way, he also conceives of this idea of, of uniting with the active intellect. And these themes are, of course, perhaps mostly visible in the tradition of Sufism, or, or Islamic mysticism, often so-called, where there is this emphasis on traveling on the spiritual path, on ascending levels or stations until one reaches the highest stations, which include, for example, the idea of fana, of becoming an, uh, annihilated in God, of becoming completely extinguished and realizing that God is the only reality. So this is, of course, very similar to Plotinus's idea of uniting or becoming the one in that sense. It is clear there are many parallels and correspondences between the school of Neoplatonism and a lot of Islamic thought, which I hope I have given you uh, proper examples of in this episode. And today we've only looked at a really tiny selection of, of thinkers and movements within Islam that has these kind of... of, of uh, ideas and, and these kind of neoplatonic um, features to it right um, but there is the topic is much vaster than that and even then we've only focused on one of the major abrahamic religions because indeed neoplatonism has been influential on all of the so-called western religions or abrahamic religions and even beyond it's it's one of the most influential and and important philosophical movements and schools systems in all of history that has influenced everything from judaism kabbalah within judaism uh, christianity uh, western esotericism or esotericism generally, uh, all across the board, Neoplatonism is incredibly influential. And that is, again, why it is so incredible that I am part of this massive collaboration with some of my great colleagues here on YouTube, uh, a collaboration that is sorely needed in order for this this very significant school of Neoplatonism to be, to be presented to a broader audience and to also talk about the different ways that has influenced our world and the way that we see things and some of the major religions and intellectual schools that are still part of our society and world today. Hopefully you've learned a thing or two here about Neoplatonism, both in general, but also in particular in this episode about its relationship with Islamic thought and Sufism. We will, of course, be discussing Neoplatonism more in the future because it is a topic that's going to come up whether we like it or not. But now we've laid some of the groundwork to see how this tradition has, well, first of all, in our previous episode, what this tradition and philosophy is to begin with, but also now also how it has influenced some of the greatest intellectual and religious traditions uh, in history and even today. So look forward to more episodes on this topic. Check out the videos by the other channels. Thank you, as always, to all of my patrons, of course, who keep this channel going, without whom I would not be able to do any of this. And I will see you next time.